Okay, everyone, we're we're ready to go. Um, basically, nobody changed in the room, so I just repeat fastly. Please do something with your cell phones, not to go off during the talk. Please, please. We are receiving a lot of complaints, and it's not fair. So um, we're here with um, Jacinta Richardson, um, a the person who runs Pearl Training Australia now, and we're so happy to have you here. I'm, I'm just going to skip the resume because it's long. I'm just going to say that she enjoys the scuba diving, cycling, and, bi and biking too. So um, we're having a talk on helping your audience learn. Okay, if you want the finer details, my bio in and all of its length is actually on the website as well, of course. Okay, who here is enjoying the conference? Yeah, yeah awesome. Okay, who here has been to a talk in every single session that they've possibly been able to so far? Awesome. There's a lot of them. This is just today. Who here is beginning to think that their brain's filling up? Getting a tad full? Yeah, it happens. Training is harder. Learning is harder. Intensive learning is harder still. Way, way harder than going to every talk and every, every slot at a conference. Because at a conference, you get to pick what talks you go to. You can go, you know, I'm feeling a little tired now. I'm going to go to the talk on learning rather than the one on deep, dark magic. Or vice versa. You can say, I'm going to go learn about mentoring, which is a nice, gentle subject, and it's not deep, dark, technical stuff, which is the session we just had, for those who missed it, versus learning about database stuff, or vice versa. You have a choice. Or, of course, you can just pick the hallway track. You can have a break. <laughs> you can have a longer lunch. You get to choose, and that makes it easier. Very, very few talks at a conference assume that you went to the talk beforehand. Occasionally, you might get tutorials that do that, but not five days' worth. And better yet, you're not going to be assessed. You might have to write up something for your workplace to prove that you actually paid attention. That's the hardest it's going to be, and you can cheat. You know you can cheat. All you need to do is look at the abstract and say, I went to the talk, they talked about this. Copy or paste from the abstract. <laughs> and watch the video if you really want the finer points. So it's actually pretty easy. So you can cheat. You do not get assessed. You can cheat. It doesn't matter if you don't understand everything you see or hear. Training is different. Intensive learning is different. Picking up a manual and trying to work your way through it is different because you have to understand all of it. Just like a conference, you might be learning all day long for six to eight hours at a go. Except again, as I said, conferences are easier. You might be doing this for several days in a row, where each day builds on previous days. So you can't afford to get lost. If you didn't, didn't understand or remember any of day one's material, you're probably going to struggle in day three. If you felt a bit sick day two afternoon because you had a big night the night before, went to the speaker's party or something, and decided to sleep off the afternoon, day three is not going to make any sense. So you can't afford to get lost. So training, whether or not you're at a training course, studying a manual, all of these things becomes harder. And everything, as I said, builds on what you've, you've learned before. So how can you create materials? How can you create documents, manuals, how-tos, training courses that will be worked on over a decent period of time that it allows people to learn effectively? How can you make it easy to learn? And that's what this talk is about. Before I tell you all of that, just a quick summary of where I'm coming from. I'm a software engineer. Some of you are probably software engineers too. I actually have a degree that says this. It's awesome. I'm a technical writer. I don't have a degree that says this. I just tend ended up doing a lot of technical writing. I love it. It's great. Writing is awesome. And I'm a trainer, strangely enough. Running, working for a business called Pearl Training Australia. <laughs> what a surprise. Our most common course that we run is a five-day course called Programming Pearl. 
where I get to stand up in front of an audience for five days in a row, <coughs> get incredibly sore feet, and enthuse to them as if I haven't done this a hundred times already. It's great. I love teaching people Perl. Now, this, is, this course is basic to intermediate, so most of the time I'm building up from the very groundwork. Days are long. Six to six and a half hours of learning is lots of work. And we pack that tight full of information. In fact, if I could, I'd make them come on Saturday as well. I want to teach them more than I could fit into five days. And I have a super wide range of students. Some of them can program. Hopefully most of them, but less than you'd hope. Some of them last programmed 10 something years ago. And they've forgotten everything. In fact, they think they can program, and that makes it harder than people who, who know that they can't. The really, really fun students think this is programming. <laughs> <laughs> I am not joking. But it's like, yeah, so please tell me your previous programming experience, blah, 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 blah. I can write HTML. Great. So this is stuff I've learned. And I want to start with a great co concept called cognitive load. Bit of theory. Who here has heard the concept of cognitive load? Oh good, about half of you. Excellent. Who thinks they understand it? <laughs> Fewer of you. Excellent. Hopefully at the end of this talk you'll all have a slightly better handle on that. Cognitive load relates to how much effort someone has to apply in order to learn a new thing. And there are three types of cognitive load. There's intrinsic cognitive load, which basically means some things are harder than others. And that's all it means. Learning what, how to work out the value for 2 plus 2 is relatively simple. It has a fairly low intrinsic cognitive load. Working out how to understand subster comparatively has a much higher intrinsic load. This is probably easy for you, but I picked something you'd recognize. If I picked some other things where you'd have to regularly look up the man page just to work out the order of arguments, it would be a better example perhaps. But this has a higher intrinsic cognitive load. And when you hit these kind of things, when you're going, well, this problem just naturally has a higher intrinsic cognitive load, tough luck, good luck, write good documentation. Now, there's also extraneous cognitive load. That's basically when the trainer is making it harder than it needs to be. So this one. For example, if I just find a shape like this, you would have to read that a couple of times. Most of you would work out pretty quickly what I meant, but I could have just said square or given a diagram. So extraneous cognitive load is when the person who has written the materials hates their students. but you should love them. So to avoid extraneous cognitive load, choose the medium that suits the message best. Say square, show a diagram. It's not that hard. It shouldn't be that hard. Finally, germane cognitive load is this one. It's all about how well our concepts build upon the concepts we already understand. So it's the scaffolding, the mental framework, People learn better if what they're learning builds on things they already know. So if you already know how to program, you will find learning Perl easier than if you're trying to learn Perl and programming at the same time. Likewise for any programming language. If you know Python reasonably well, you'll find learning how to use a new library in Python much easier than trying to learn the new library and Python at the same time. If you can build on ideas that people already have, it's easier. So if you know it, addition, you can learn multiplication. Nice and easy. Again, you know programming, you can learn Perl. Now, it is building a scaffolding, building that framework that you can then build on further takes time. So you, if you are writing materials, you have to build that solidly and you have to provide that information in a way that someone can absorb the structure you want them to get. Obviously, the more you have to learn, for example, five days at six and a half hours a day, the stronger the, that basic scaffolding you're giving the students has to be. So we do this by giving examples. 
lots of examples. Very simple examples. People say, but, but what about real world applications? You say, I don't care. I want you to understand the concept. You can do the real world stuff during the break. But you don't start with, OK, let's work out how to get cron to send an email when you just want to talk about sending an email. So build strong foundations. Really, really concentrate on this. When you are creating any kind of material, whether it's a course or otherwise, sit down, write down a, a mind map, if you can, of how the ideas go together, and then translate that into the material you're writing. Works for talks as well. So here's some ways that we can reduce the extraneous cognitive load. That's the stuff that's your fault when you hate the person who is using your documentation. First of all, let's think about our day. I've said you get six to six and a half hours of, of teaching time a day. Be realistic. Don't try to cram in more than that period of time's worth of learning. Be aware that you're going to have breaks, you're going to have lunch breaks, of course, and you're going to have students who turn up late. For some reason, some students just fail consistently to turn up before 9.30 or something in the morning. And you have to deal with that because you can't afford them, to, everybody or half your class to lose that information. So six and a half hours is optimistic. And six hours is much more likely. And that's great. Because actually six hours seems to be, in my experience, about how long most adults can actually concentrate for a day. When you push beyond this, when you try to cram more time in, we have people sometimes say, well, what if we have three days, but we have like 10 hour days? Would you do that? I'm like, yes, I would do that. Your students won't. When you push beyond this, you just increase the load without gaining much benefit. And I have a diagram to show you this in a bit. So how do we use this time? I say go in about 90 minutes and then have a break. And you'll see that conference timetables do a very similar thing. So I usually use these kind of blocks of time with two breaks and a one hour lunch break in there, which gives me six hours. If I absolutely must, I'll squeeze some more time in because I don't need 30 minutes for a tea break. If you just walk out to the, cat, to the breakout area, pour yourself a coffee and you're done, right? If you drink coffee, bah. <laughs> so you could do this. And I do this sometimes. Although I have the other problem that sometimes I forget to give my students breaks. So I have to tell them, remind me at 10.30 it's time for a break. Because I'll just keep going through to lunchtime, which is a bit bad. So you can squeeze it and get an extra 30 minutes of training time a day. Or you can make yourself really popular. You'll be surprised at how well this works. You can let them go home early. OK, hopefully you don't actually expect your students to learn too much in any single day. And this does apply to documents too. Have short prose sections. Have short examples. Have tight chapter boundaries. Ideally, a chapter can be worked through in 90 minutes. If you want somebody to be working through four chapters a day, if they're going to spend a whole day on this, then that, those fit them to those blocks I just showed you. So a chapter should not be, even with examples and working through time, should not be more than 90 minutes if that's how you want to structure your material. People have terribly short attention spans these days. Twitter is an excellent example. So how do you make the most of your day? Of course, you put the really important stuff at the start. This is the material that people will actually remember. So don't waste all your time in the morning by saying, hey, I'm, this is who I am, and this is what we do, and you know, here's some basic rules, and all of that, unless it's actually stuff that they need to remember. When they're best in the morning because they've probably had coffee. They've just woken up. Ideally, they slept the night before. And so they'll be refreshed and better able to understand your ideas. By the end of the day, they're falling asleep. So you put the easy stuff, the stuff that it doesn't actually matter if they don't understand it so well. The stuff that does tomorrow and the next day and the next day does not rely upon. But in the future, they can go, hang on, we covered something on that course at, you know, once upon a time. I'll just go look through, through the manual. So really, this is the, and here's stuff that would be nice for you to know kind of time of day. Because your students have full brains. 
and they just want to do their evening events and they want to let the ideas that they've learned settle a bit. Full brains are kind of like full stomachs. If you wait long enough, you can learn more stuff. Or if your stomach, you wait long enough, you can probably have dessert. Pick a really, really good starting point. Move the essentials, as I said, not only to the start of the day, but also to the start of the course. Move the very basic principles as much as you can to the start of your course materials, to the start of your training manuals, to the, even to the start of your how-to, even if it's stuff you'll then come back to. This makes it really hard to order things because you're like, well, this is the order I like them in. And you're like, no, I have to say these things come first. As a typical example, if you pay attention to how some people order, say, Perl courses, I see hashes turning up on the third day. I want my students to so thoroughly grok hashes that even if they leave the course and understand nothing else, they know scalars, arrays, and hashes. So hashes have to be on my first day. In fact, they have to be on before lunch on the first day. It's something that I find courses again and again put the late on. I'm like, they're not that hard. But they are if you wait until the third day. <laughs> Try to put the essential stuff, the stuff that even if they don't remember anything else, they must remember this, put that at the start of the course, as close to the start as you can. Don't waste time by going into introductions and all of that. Cover real material, because you've only got 90 minutes. The first 90 minutes of the first day of your course is the best chance you will have of getting students to remember stuff. Fill that full of the important stuff. Don't waste the time, because it's the freshest they'll be in the entire course that you run. Finish wisely. Put all the optional extra stuff, the stuff that would be nice for them to know, the stuff that they can teach themselves at the end in the last chapter, at the end of each chapter. Certainly at the end of every fourth chapter if you want them to do four chapters a day. All the stuff they can survive without because they can build upon it, put that at the end. Because that's when they're least able to learn. And here's my pretty graph. Ability to retain information, time material covered. The first day they can learn really well and their ability to learn tapers off rapidly. The end of the fourth day, they stop learning stuff. Halfway through the fifth day, they start forgetting stuff. So the fifth day, you start just putting them, you know, this would be nice for you to learn stuff there. I don't really expect you to try. I'm not even going to make you do the exercises unless you're really, really awake and eager because they're not going to actually learn anything there. They're probably going to forget stuff that I told them. So keep this in mind with any kind of material. But, but, but the stuff I want to tell them is important. I really want them to know. They need to know like all of this stuff, and they need to know OO, and they need to know how to do databases and web servers, and wouldn't it be great if they could do all these other things? Create another course. Make more money. <laughs> <laughs> and think hard about how you're teaching your information. Rather than describing what a square looks like, use a diagram that has a square in it. Even if your presentation manuals make that hard, pull out Xfig or something better. Inkscape is quite popular right here. And draw the thing and then import the picture. Because diagrams and Dilbert comics and pictures are all great ways to encourage people to learn. Wake them up, make them pay attention. Certainly don't have huge wads of just lots of text. Small amount of prose, lots of examples. A few comics if you can find them relevant. And enhance your material. It does not have to be boring. So how can we reduce germane cognitive load? How can we make structure our material to give them strong scaffolding to work with? Well, we order it carefully. You are in complete control of the order of the stuff that you write. Whether it's for giving a talk, running a course, creating a manual, even creating a how-to or a website. You are in control of that. You get to choose which order those paragraphs appear in, which order those pages appear in. Don't let someone else say, no, 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 you need to do it this way because that's the way. If you think it will work better, that you can build a better structure, do it that way. So focus on getting all the absolute essential ideas done before lunchtime, preferably the first day, but building on these ideas. So you group your similar concepts. 
I say that hashes are important because you need to understand them for references, but they're also data structures, so I want to put them with the scalars and arrays. And I always wonder about the other courses where their people don't. If you have other similar ideas, for example, if you were teaching Inkscape, you might have a bunch of the line tools, including how to create shapes, because they're line tools, versus scattering them evenly throughout the material. And provide the scaffolding. If you can, provide them a map of how you're getting to all the material. So a visual indication, a mind map or something. Possibly even a tree of ideas so they can see how all of these things are related. Put things in bold. You'd be surprised. Very few things do this, although don't overdo it. If there's a rule, if there's a key example, if this is the correct and preferred solution versus the other examples you've given, if there's something you want students to be able to see when they flick through the manual if they've printed it out, or see as they scroll through your page, put it in bold. There's a great, great movie called uh, Making the Cut, where a med student just basically memorizes everything in bold and passes the exam. And all of his friends are really upset with him because they didn't. It's like, it works, put things in bold. So how do we structure our 90 minute training blocks? We try to stick to 10, 10. 10 minutes of, of me up the front talking, 10 minutes of the students playing with the idea. It works reasonably well. But remember, whatever it takes someone who is newly learning 10 minutes to do, will probably only take you one to three minutes to do. So when I say 10, 10, it's not 10 minutes for you to solve the, the exercise, but more like two to three minutes for you to solve those exercises. Sometimes we do 10, 20. If it's a big practical exercise, we really want them to throw a whole bunch of concepts together at once. I don't really recommend 10 to 30, but sometimes it happens. Maybe once every two days or so. This allows the students to learn the idea, that's what you've just described to them, practice that idea, and then hopefully they'll understand it. If not, get them to, to quiz you about it during one of the breaks. And in your instruction, try to limit what you tell them to one to three concepts. One to three concepts in that 10 minutes, then they get to play with those. Now this doesn't always flow perfectly. Sometimes it's, if you do this, you end up with too many exercises. Sometimes if you do this, you just can't quite fit all of the ideas into that amount of break. Some fluidity is important. So these are not hard and fast and solid rules. But make sure you take at least 10 minutes on these ideas because you don't want too many exercises. Because strangely enough, students can get exercise fatigue. They can get sick of actually trying to do stuff. If you can't fill 10 minutes, of course, add another concept. Or more examples. More examples are always a great idea. So we have roughly this sort of format for each of our 90 minute sessions. That's 18 concepts a day. 18. That's not actually that many. Keep that in mind. But once you've done it, once you've written down, these are the 18 things I want them to learn each day, and you do that for however many days you want to write down concepts for, it starts making structuring a lot easier. Now what do we aim for with all of our exercises? Obviously you want an exercise per concept, and they all should be directly relevant to the example you gave. So these are not, or to the concepts you covered. So these are not necessarily real world examples because you don't have time for that. These are, I've told you stuff, have a go at playing with it. And this, is, this applies in how to's and documentation as well. The real world stuff is absolutely essential, but when you're trying to learn something, getting distracted by all the extra stuff just increases the cognitive load for very little value. So ideally, one point, one exercise, that gives you three or so exercises each. Sometimes you'll have some exercises that combine the concepts as well. Now, you also need to cater for different skill levels. Unfortunately, not everyone is as awesome at these things as you are. So you have easier all the way through to advanced exercises. And you tell your students, for those who have been struggling, 
I want you to get up to at least here. For those who have generally been finishing, I want you to get up to about here. And of course, for everyone else, try to, try to do all of them. Not all the students will finish all of the exercises all of the time. Surprising idea that no. So what about the really bright students? What about those ones who've done a bit of something before, who, who know all this stuff? For them, of course, it's easy. You give them the real world examples. You say, OK, if you've raced forward in these exercises, please have a go at these ones when you have finished the exercises at each time. And you need about three to four. I find a bit less than one per day is about perfect. These should span 80% of the course, which means that they may actually get to points where they can't continue without reading forward. Oh dear, shocking idea. Students will actually read forward if they need to. It's great. And they should be really, really challenging. They should be things that get the students having to think and possibly getting the students to con cover concepts that you don't cover, that they might have to do some research for. Not impossible, not really, really hard, but just enough to push the kind of bright students who are coming through your material, uh, through your course. If you're dealing with material, it might be the things to just challenge people a little bit extra because you can. And you don't give them answer files because then they'll just cheat. They do actually, even the really bright students. You're like, please don't look at the answers until you're finished. They're like, oh, I already understood it, so I read the answer. Next, we'll talk about content structuring. Most importantly, and this is the one that so many people get wrong with training, less problematic with documentation. Do not have chapters rely on each other. As much as possible, reduce cross-chapter reliance. Even in manuals, because people don't like having to flick back and forth all the time. If you want to teach them a concept here and it doesn't absolutely have to rely on the concept you covered the day before, don't rely on the concept you covered the day before. In my case, I teach them subroutines near the end of a day. It's just the best place to put it. Because I taught them near the end of a day, there is no way I'm going to rely, expect them to remember subroutines for the rest of the course. They know they exist. I give them sample code to save them from having to do them again. I want students to write subroutines. I just don't want to have to make them remember it for every chapter. Now, of course, it is sometimes necessary, of course, I can't teach references if they don't know arrays and scalars and hashes. Sometimes you absolutely have to rely on previous stuff. That was the stuff you covered in day one, remember. Hopefully you can remind them of the key things they need to remember there throughout the material. But it is, of course, somewhat problematic. You can't teach everything as a brand new concept, particularly if you're creating a tree of concepts. But do your best to reduce it. Because people, students who do miss material, because perhaps they're tired, they have a higher germane cognitive load. Perhaps they struggled with previous material already, and now you're asking them, needlessly, asking them to remember that material they struggled with. Perhaps they missed it because they had to take a phone call, or the server was melting down and they had to go off and take the afternoon to fix it. Happens in my courses all the time then you're disadvantaging the students who don't know that material. So as much as possible, for each new chap chapter, it's a new topic, it's a clean slate. This is also very handy with, with, with mater uh, training material, uh, manuals and other non-training materials because someone can flip to the chapter they need, read through it, and learn those concepts without having to go back and read the five chapters that came before it. And that might be enough of the information to get them where they need to go. Now, your course notes are a great aid to your students. You need good, thorough course notes. And they, they really should be comprehensive. They should be things that students can work with all the time. Don't give your students slides. Usually, if your slides are good, they will... Um, if your slides are good as a resource, they are crap for people to, to see on the screen because you spend the entire time reading them all out. <laughs> yes. Direct, decent course notes allow the students to come back to, enjoy them, and reread them, and share them with their, their colleagues. They're great advertising for you. And so is your documentation. Great documentation for any open source project is something other open source projects are likely to say, do it like this. And that's great advertising too. 
Now, just a few general ideas which are not related to cognitive load, but some ideas that I've found incredibly helpful. Think about your environmental conditions. Keep the room cold. If the room is cold, people will not fall asleep. They will remain much, remain much fresher in their heads. Yes, I know. It's not my fault. I'd like this room to be th like 21 to 23 degrees in this room. I think we'd all be happy, right? <laughs> now, admittedly, if they're sitting directly under air convent, they'll probably be wearing a jacket and shivering slightly, which is a little mean if it's like 21 degrees. But I try to push the rooms down as cold as I can, particularly in Brisbane, because cold students are more, more alert. And what can I tell you what my students are like? They fit a bell curve, unsurprisingly. The bell curve applies. If I have nine students, which is about right for my class sizes, sometimes it's like around seven or eight, but I'll have this. I'll have three students who are doing much more slowly than I'd like. Three students who are average, two who are doing only the exercises, but they're doing them quickly enough that they can read their email afterwards, and one who has not only read all their email, but is also trying all the ex advanced exercises. Now when I say slow, I'm not talking about intelligence. This has nothing to do with their intelligence. It's often one of these problems. They have not done programming for a while, or they've never done it before, and they've got all of this extra work just trying to remember all of that stuff, learn all that stuff, plus remember and understand what I just told them. You will have the same. People who are reading your documentation will have the same problems. And of course, the students who do really well tend to have done lots of languages or lots of programming. They have, or possibly, they've just come out of university. I love having new, uh, just left university into the workforce students in my class because they fly through material. They've just spent the last 18 something years of their life learning nonstop. They just soak the material up. Adults, on the other hand, we don't actually learn stuff all the time. Not on a regular basis. So target your course to the slowest average student, which means you're going to leave some people behind. Offer them extra help. Offer them tea breaks and lunch times to catch them up. Strangely enough, these are the ones who are less likely to actually ask for that help, but try to get them to accept it anyway. Do not slow down to meet the slowest student, because they will slow down even more. And finally, good luck. Any questions? Someone might run around with a mic or I'll just repeat your question. Yes. Structuring courses for internal training when you don't have to cram it into a single block. Yep. Okay, for the benefit of the microphone, if we're structuring a course for internal training where we don't have a, a, such a fixed period of time, we have maybe three hours once a week. Any suggestions? Is that a fair summary? Okay, um, yes, you still ideally would have a plan for that training. You'd still ideally have which six concepts you wish to cover each of those sets of time. Admittedly, you might need to add some on if you've made mistakes. But you would plan those out and you would still say, okay, these are the six concepts we're covering this week, the next week. Make a nice tree, work out where they best sit together. And again, ideally, spend the really important stuff at the start and the less important stuff at the end. Particularly in a workplace environment where people are friendly and liable to chat and perhaps let things slide a little. Get the key stuff in early because the last portion of the second part may actually uh, be missed occasionally. Yes, yeah, so there was one other one slightly, yes? How do you measure the effectiveness of your teaching? How do we measure our, the effect, effectiveness of our teaching? There's a couple of ways. Feedback forms are not particularly useful, that's really just how well we made the students like us. And the students love us, which is great, but it doesn't really tell us whether or not they, it worked. The best way is actually just looking at the code they're writing. If the, in our case, if the students are understanding the material, the code gets better and they do, actively they do poorly. 
the, the longer through the week, the less well everybody does because their brains are full. But the solutions they're coming up with are, about, are appropriate. And of course in Perl there's more than one way to do it, so there's about nine students in my class, there'll be like ten different answers. <laughs> but really you can get a feel for how well the students are understanding the material and how well they're doing at it just by watching them do it. We occasionally, not very often, but we occasionally have employers ask us how did these, students, these people go or which of these did well because we sometimes we do training for organisations who are thinking to hire the people we're, or some of the people we're looking at and it really becomes clear which ones are really switched on, which ones are the fast students. Any other questions? Yes? Right, okay, so you've planned a course, it's one day long, it's, got, it's worked really well the first couple of times, the third time you're running it, possibly for a different organisation, it's just lagging. All of the students are just a little, taking a little longer for each exercise, everything is just a little bit further behind. Happens to me all the time. People, classes learn at different speeds. They even learn at different speeds in different days. Like one day I'm like, okay, given yesterday, this is going to be hellish, how am I going to get it all finished? And then we fly through and you're like, how did that happen? There's a couple of things I do. One is to increase my pace. I will actively cut back the exercises time to what I need them to be. So I'll say, look, I know you're not all going to get these finished. Try to get the first two questions out of seven finished. And they will, because two out of seven is not actually a hard ask. And if I were really, really slacking, like really, really lagging behind and I'm getting a bit panicky about it, I'm like, okay, look, we are running significantly behind. I'm going to give you a 45 minute lunch break instead of an hour. But the thing I didn't mention that I should have was when you give your students a break, for example, morning tea or afternoon tea, some of them want to spend the entire time reading the email or talking on IRC or other, anything other than getting up or out of their computer. Kick them out of the room. Say, go. Stretch your legs, get your blood flowing, you're not allowed to stay in this room, there's got to be a five minute break of everyone out of this room. Which lets me check my email. But, <laughs> but more importantly, blood flow is actually really important. Get people up and moving. But yes, to answer your question, cut back lunchtime and accept that the last material on every part of every day is optional. To an extent. Does that answer your question? Any others? Someone over here perhaps? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for everything, and especially no more phones went off. Uh, on behalf of LCA this year, I want to give you this thank you gift. Thank you. I believe it's afternoon tea now. Afternoon tea break now? Yes. Yes. Feel free to come and quiz.